Jean-Luc Picard is back. We're moving. However, they were second guessed after the most important licensees made it known. Mr. Spock, the Vulcan, second in command. Potential licensees are stating they're only interested in merchandising material that much more closely resembles the original Star Trek series. Just how important are Star Trek merchandise sales to the overall franchise? Is it true that the combined power of the 143 official licensees of Star Trek merchandise could put a show like Picard on hold for set? costume and prop redesigns because they refuse to make merchandise for it? It's an interesting question, and one not easily answered. To do so, what I think we really need to do is get a grasp on the current state of Star Trek merchandise as a whole. And to do that, let's start from the beginning. The year is 1964, and Gene Roddenberry is just starting the process to get his wagon train of the stars off the ground. They felt I had offered them a wagon train to the stars, which I had, because I wanted to sell it. And westerns were very big at the time. One of the earliest deals made by then Star Trek production studio Desilu was with AMT. Known for making models, AMT started producing a small-scale replica of the USS Enterprise, which by all accounts became a fan favorite. They also stepped in to help build the shuttle Galileo used on set during filming of the original series. However, it wasn't long before the first merchandising misstep took place. Once Paramount took over corporate ownership of the show's production in 1967, a new licensee was brought in to the mix to start generating much-needed revenue, Remco Toys. Remco's approach was simple place a literal Star Trek sticker onto existing toy products, and market them to the show's fans as official merchandise through a process simply known as label slapping. Things didn't improve for the show, even after its cancellation. And from 1969 to 1976, Paramount started pumping out every single piece of merchandise under the sun, including, but not limited to, chalkboards, disc shooters, freesicles, parachute Kirk and Spock, and this fucking thing. It is important to note that while certain aspects of the Trek merchandise was being handled rather poorly, the Trek apparel was starting to sell out all across the nation, partly due to the increase of fan conventions. On the whole, things were quite a mess for Star Trek fans in the mid-1970s. That was until the ultimate toy man himself, Marty Abrams, came onto the scene. Star Trek USS Enterprise gift set. Star Trek action figures also sold separately by Mego. Harnessing the power of his Mego brand, Marty Abrams unleashed a torrent of new Star Trek merchandise into the market. And from 1976 to 1978, Mego made a reported $150 million in sales as a Star Trek licensee, which is over half a billion dollars when adjusted for inflation. While there were some head-scratching products like the Mission to Gamma 4 playset, to expect, we approached the idol. Its jaws were moving. The Mego 8-inch figures and the usable bridge set were a warp speed success. Sadly, this Trek toy victory would be shortly lived. Star Wars, released in 1977, took some time to properly capitalize on their toy and merchandising market, but once it did, the profit margins for Mego and the Trek brand were cut by a reported 75%. Desperate to reignite their merchandising sales and to capitalize on the new resurgence of space fantasy films, Paramount greenlit Star Trek The Motion Picture. We are aboard a huge starship called the Enterprise. This is the return of Captain Kirk. An alien object of unbelievable destructive power is less than three days away from this planet. This ultimately proved to be another misstep. In 1979, the motion picture was released to poor critical reviews and a lack of interest from audiences. Paramount and Gene Roddenberry both failed to understand who their target audience was and did not capitalize correctly on the success of Star Wars' more fantasy-style approach. This failure would prove catastrophic, as Mego overproduced Trek toys for the film to try to recapture their market, but would ultimately lead to the company closing down. Because of the motion picture's failure and the lack of merchandising sales, 
Paramount would go on to miss the mark for every single Star Trek film up until around the film Star Trek 2009 by either overproducing for films that didn't sell well or underproducing for fan favorites. While Paramount continued to trip over itself on the big screen, things were not faring any better for the small screen. In 1987, Galoob is hired to create toys for the next generation show that is just starting up, which everyone hated. They looked terrible, made little sense in design choices, and ultimately fell flat. Merchandising revenue was looking bleak for the Star Trek brand. However, after a decade of one failure after another, Dilithium was struck once again, this time in the form of licensing deals with Playmates Toys. Computer subspace transmission to Starfleet Command from Enterprise. Stardate 4548.4. It's a single blast, source unknown. Lieutenant Worf checks weapon systems. Captain Picard orders full shields from Lieutenant LaForge in engineering. Suddenly there is an alien presence on the ship. It's one of the Borg, a hostile robotic life form. Commander Riker returns phaser fire. Star Trek, the next generation action figures from Playmates. In 1989, Playmates Toys officially picked up the merchandising license from Paramount, and it began a renaissance of Star Trek toys, creating high quality items, ships, replica props, and action figures, all of which were well received by fans and a resounding financial success. The creation of a new Star Trek show also boosted overall sales to the aging Star Trek apparel line, which could now begin selling merchandise featuring the new show and crew and their uniforms. In 1994, Playmate decided to ramp up their attempt at creating more exclusive and limited edition toy lines within the Star Trek franchise. This was done with the intention of reducing their footprint of the larger production of toys into more selective high-end items. Unfortunately, this move had unintended consequences, as many fans were left with incomplete sets because they were unable to purchase them in the limited times they were being offered. Fans at the time had strong desire for a completed set, and resented Playmates for not giving them the opportunity to do so. This situation is regarded by some as the catalyst that kicked off the collector mentality within the Trek fandom as well, and shifted the overall focus for future merchandisers. Frustration with Playmates handling of the limited edition toys grew, and by 1999, with almost 400 unique Star Trek items created, Playmates dropped their license agreement. Learning from Playmates' mistakes, in 2001, Art Asylum, later to be known as Diamond Select Toys, produced their first set of high-end Star Trek merchandise, utilizing computer scanning technology. This technology enabled the company to create highly detailed sculpts of props, costumes, ships, and cast members. Inventory for these items weren't as expansive as a generic toy line, but nor were they as restrictive as Playmate was doing back in the 90s. This struck a middle ground with production, which seems to be well received by fans. This approach, arguably, furthered the disconnect from more traditional toy sales towards the higher end Trek collectibles. Granted, Paramount and Bad Robot attempted to re-enter the merchandising fray, and more specifically the toy market, with their film Star Trek 2009. Oh, the Enterprise are under attack. Right alert! Battle station! The Starship Enterprise with real battle sounds. Direct hit to the transport! Energize. Beam Captain Kirk down to the planet, then... Beam me up! Beam him back up again. They even went back to veteran Trek toy company Playmates to help guide their global toy sales agenda. However, this deal was quickly canned due to reported quality control disputes between the various companies involved. Now, we are back at the present. As of now, Trek merchandise isn't being produced primarily by simple toy companies but by collectible juggernauts like Eagle Moss, Diamond Select Toys, and McFarlane. And while some outlets would have you believe that Trek merchandise is in a slump, or that Star Trek Discovery for that matter has no merchandise available to purchase at all, the opposite would be true. From shirts and jackets, to pins, to ships, to books, to pops, and more sophisticated character models, Discovery and the rest of Star Trek does have plenty of merchandise available all around the internet. While it is true to say that Trek has a lack of presence inside of brick and mortar stores, there are dozens of websites selling Trek related items, including over 15 websites selling Discovery merchandise. It's important to understand as well that the merchandising landscape has shifted over the last 50 years since Star Trek has been around. The Trek brand, at least for right now, seems to be focused on apparel, which has been a consistent selling point for Star Trek throughout the years, their high-end collectibles, 
DVD and Blu-ray box sets, and board games, all being sold direct to consumer through online shopping. So, taking into consideration the long troubled history of Star Trek merchandising, its shift to more collectible items in the mid-90s, and the current merchandising landscape of 2019, you need to ask yourself, would a show featuring the return of one of the most popular captains in Star Trek, Jean-Luc Picard, be put on hold because a few of the licensees were upset over the sets and the props? Without any hard evidence either way, the answer is left up to each of you to decide. Major, uh,